state your name and uh, your uh, uh, title that you want uh, under your name. Yusef Bunchy Shakur, neighborhood organizer slash revolutionary. Great. Um, and if you could just tilt your head up a little bit so we get more. Uh, That's good? Yeah. Alrighty. I mean, we have a, a little bit of a shadow there. Um, uh, let's see. I don't know if the hat will make a difference, actually. But, uh, it'll work with this. Um, so, this one is, is uh, please state your name and age where you were incarcerated. Yeah, my name is Yusef Bunchy Shakur. I was incarcerated in the state of Michigan. How long were you in prison, and what age were you when uh, when you went inside, and how old were you when upon release? So I was charged at the age of um, 18. I was convicted at, at, at the age of 19. I was sentenced five to 15 years in, in prison. I served nine years. Um, I was released January 3rd, 2001. Okay. And then how old were you? I was, again, 19 when I went in, I was 28, going on 29 when I, when I came home. Okay. Um, let's see. And uh, can you describe how it feels to be free? You don't, you don't, you could answer how. That's a uh, tricky question. It's interesting because of when you're in prison, all you think about is, is, is getting out. You know, the taste, taste of, of freedom. But to be black in America, the question in our minds, what is freedom? You know, I'm free now, but do I, are we, are, am I really free? And the fact of the matter is, when I walk down the street, my neighborhood, there's a high probability I will get pulled over. You know, when I go to the stores, there's a high probability I'm, I'm being targeted um, or trying to find employment. It's not easy. We're trying to get into school, but it's not easy. And all those things I've been able to overcome individually, and what they try to do is hit me with that exceptionalism. Like, oh, you're so exceptional. In reality, I'm still part of a population. Um, but if you can push myself to answer that question, the freedom in its truest sense of, of being the best revolutionary I can be in the service of my community, of being the best father I can be in the service of loving my two sons, and, being the best community member of, of fighting to improve the quality of life and the quality of my neighborhood by creating a, a better opportunity for formerly incarcerated men and women as they come home. Um, but it's more than just changing policy, it's about changing mindsets and also understanding that we're fighting against a system that, that breeds oppression. So freedom is, 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 is an idea that fighting for but it also within myself the, fr the freedom to be my authentic self our authentic selves great and uh what do you hope to get out of this uh trip i mean if, like anytime you get a trip to go somewhere uh, i mean this first time being in south carolina um, you know it breeds you know new opportunity it breeds new, new wisdom new life but i think fundamentally you know to be with, with individuals who, who've been incarcerated, because again, when we think about incarceration, um, you know, it's like, okay, Michigan, but to meet folks who've been in Maryland and, and et cetera, like incarceration, it has no borders. And, and it, the pain is the same, it, the, the misery is the same, but we're brothers of, we're sisters of the same fight. And you know, to, to hear that, those, those, you know, we're more than the story, we're a narrative, right? We, and that's what we have to get out of, like the, the collectivism, redefining ourselves so that being able to be re rejuvenated. Like I've been home 20 years because of Mas Musa and, and, and John and you know, who've been out not as long as I have. I, it, it, it reminds me of, of what this is about, which is you know, men, and women, men and women having the right to come home, but to going back to the other question of being free. Like you're 
freedom but to be ourselves. And this is what this trip is about. Like the boys are traveling because again, like we, we told her we can't travel. We told her not, and, and it's like that invisible chain that's around your neck that can keeps you from going so far. Because you know, I'm a black man, but the society always saying you a nigga. So nigga know your place. So trying to fight to move that di that dichotomy out outside of ourselves, you know, you could taste the ability to be by the water, right? It, it's it's so uh, full of bliss, like, but it's it's like an illusion too, because we've never had this. this like, the, that's a luxury that we don't experience. You know, coming from poverty, coming from urban areas. So again, so I mean, that, again, as I, that question, freedom keeps coming back. It, it, it has escaped us all our lives. Because we, 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 all we know was struggle, right? All we know was pressure. And so the ability to, to you know, be at a condo off the water, like some will say that's free. Like, like you should be happy. No, I'm not happy. I enjoy it. I respect it. I'm, I'm grateful. But it tells me again the, the society that we live in, there's two societies. There's one for white folks and there's one for black folks. Separate but unequal. Mm -hmm. Right. You might have answered this uh, if you want me to skip this question. What is it like traveling with comrades you met while in prison? I mean, I mean one, the word comrade is you get thrown out loosely. I think comradeship is about principles. It's about you know, building an ideological struggle with individuals that you, because of that, that unity around the ideology, and not in, not in totality, but in, more so in the principles, this is where the, the birth of the comrade shit. Like we ain't never, we ain't have to do time together. There's just there's just unspoken things that that we just move a certain way, right? And we assist each other. We do certain things, but also the the untold narrative to the form of the incarcerated is the humbleness, is the meekness. Like you know, we all come from from rough situations, but yeah, we, we're mean, we're hum, humble people. We're, we're, we're meek individuals. You know, we we, we serve first. And so you, you see that, and that's that's refreshing. Like there, there's no no jockeying for positions. There's no fighting for orders, right? The order is just to live and and be peaceful and things. Now, now again, there's some individuals who live outside of it, but again, those are not comrades. Those are just individuals who've been incarcerated who share some some of the experience of mine, but they don't have they don't share the same value system. They don't share the same ideology, ideological framework or committed to developing ideological framework around. You know, addressing the social ills, like they've allowed themselves to be poster child. So uh, that's that's a beauty because what happens in the struggle in this work, you get isolated. Like because we're to the point, you think you're crazy, but as a status saying, like we're in status support, you got to be crazy to be willing to fight for freedom, to be willing to fight to, to improve things. So so when I meet those individuals, I'm like shit, I ain't crazy. I'm, I'm with my folks. I, I can be I mean, again my authentic self because they're their authentic self. So so it's like a blood transfusion. It's it's it's, it's energizing. Great. Um, <laughs> we have been uh, to sites that are significant to the history of African descended uh, people in this country particularly our ancestors' enslavement. Do you, do these historic sites bring up thoughts and memories of your experience? Uh, not for me per se, but for others it might. It's, it's a process, right? You're processing information. And so for me, I've, I've been involved in black studies, African studies over 20, 20 years. So the difference the ability to, to touch it, to see it and you know how I see things now. I tell you that how how different than I how I originally saw things, and, and one one in particular is redefining. Like, we, like I mentioned yesterday, like this, like slavery is American history. Black people resisting slavery is Black history. I repeat, slavery is American history. Black people re resisting slavery is Black history. And and what's so significant about that is, as the the American entertainment business continue to, to rehash our, our parts of our narrative through our heroes or whatever by showing movies and, and where we've been so traumatized. Like, I don't want to see another slave movie. And that, and that formation, I get it, because like, it's from their eyes. But if we see things from, from our lens, like we're fighting 
it brings dignity. It brings integrity from the ability to, to, to know your history, the good, the bad, the ugly, because the fact of the matter, we're still in that fight. We're still in that struggle. It's just the terrain is different. You know, they, like they said, they move the, the physical change, but the mental change, the invisible change. So um, history is not just in the past. History is in the present. So the ability to touch that, you know, as African people, we're, we're spiritual people. So, so we lost that spirituality of being engaged and engulfed in our history in that way where it, it, it reminds us, but it also, it develops it right there on the spot. So like my name is, my middle name is Bunchy. After Al Princess Bungie Carter, he was assassinated. You know, member of the LA Panthers. So I took on that name. Uh, you know, Bunchy's still alive. So when you know, oh, the part of the African traditions is we don't die. Our spirits are still alive. So to be able to be in those present is to is to engage the ancestors, and that's the process of being able to sit sit with that. And what we're going to do with that is continue the mission. All right. And this is similar. Uh, what are the connections, political, spiritual, or otherwise, between your life and the ancestors who lived and died at these sites? I think the beautiful thing is the ability to go to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I mean, going back to your other question, like we hear the stories and we, and we hear the narrative of the, of the what, what America calls the, the Atlantic slave trade. What we define through our language, the cross we. Uh, which is the ma the Maya, which is meaning this this traumatic experience that that was put upon us. But we can't hear what we are um, um, willing to, to confront. So again, you know, through confronting, through you know, engaging through our language, Swahili, the Maya, um, M A A T T, or T, where it has been defined by our elders. The great, the great tragedy, the great disaster that occurred upon us. You know, we wasn't slaves, we was prisoners. When you go to that water, you can imagine, you can see the ships, the chains, right? All, all African people that came that was kidnapped from Africa was not kings and queens, but they all was noble men and women. I repeat, they all wasn't kings and queens, but they all was noble men, women, and children. That nobility is within us. You know, when, when we evaluate and, and investigate, we see a lot of the African traditions and, and, and folklore and all that is here. It shows you how powerful we are and we have to awaken it. So that's the uh, ability to be here, more importantly, to, to, to put your feet in the Atlantic Ocean and to be able to connect with the ancestors of you know, LA. Like. And uh, last question, what, what do you see for the future? Liberation, self-determination. I mean, I think that's the end goal, but to get to the future, we have to deal with the present, which is we have to get in some rooms and have some very serious conversation with each other. We have to, to, to recommit ourselves to transformation. We, we, we're become more American than we've ever been. And what I mean by that, we're, we're adopting more of their lifestyle, more of their practice, more of their ideology. And a lot of it is just out of necessity. And we don't even realize it, right? Because because here's a double-edged sword. Like, who doesn't want to live in a peaceful neighborhood? Who doesn't want to have the ability to just go get in the car and I drive two miles and it doesn't break down on me? Who doesn't want to be able to live in a house where I don't have to, and I turn on the lights, I'm, I'm, I'm running from the roaches. And, and, I mean, that that is not associated with black life. That is associated with, with the oppression of black life. That is not associated with black life. That is associated with the oppression of black life black bodies. So so we have to commit ourselves to some basic principles, what we call restoring the native back to hood, uh, hood, to community movement builders, to building a place for formerly incarcerated, prostitutes, you know, uh, children who've been disowned, mothers, fathers, grandparents. Like we, we're, we're so disorganized. We're so scattered in our communities, locally and nationally. And not meaning everybody's going to come together, but there's a few of us that can. And we, ha we can't continue to live in the past of, like, we gotta, we're gotta going to recreate the Black Panther Party. <laughs> we're going to recreate uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or uh, some great organization or, or bring back Malcolm or bring back Ella Baker. They're not coming back. But we need to be who we are, but learn from the past. 
to, be, to build on the present, to seize a better future for black liberation and black self-determination self is a new day for black people. Awesome. Uh, would you, would you, this is just my part, would you want to see a film on the Haitian Revolution? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Toussaint Lover Children. Uh, I mean, the thing about our history is, is so um, scattered, it's so diluted. And, and that's the thing, you know, I'm, I'm a history junkie. I love history, you know, just my history, any history. And when we, when we see these these phenomenal, incredible stories, Alexander the Great, you know, who conquered Egypt or conquered the world, right? Uh, you know, I have the knowledge and, and the wisdom to understand what he did, but in principle, you know, I can't dispute the, uh, the, his, the historical components to it. I can challenge it, critically examine it, right? But my point in, in bringing that up, Hannibal, man, he brought, ele he brought elephants over mountains. You know, Tucson Overture is you know, comparing him to Napoleon. He, defe he defeated Napoleon. You know, we pride gets a, a bad look sometimes, right? But every for people to, to reach his nationhood, it needs pride. To, that pride is about communicating to who our heroes, who our she heroes was. And not, not in this uh, romanticizing way. Because again, history is still manifesting itself today. That struggle, that liberation. Because once you, once you win liberation, you have to maintain liberation. Once you win liberation, you have to maintain liberation. And to see that, to understand that, we have to look at our history from our lens to be able to dissect it. So the Tucson the Overture is one aspect, one part of a victory of, of, cap of a captive nation that became free. That's moving, that's powerful. Just think about it, talking about it. We don't talk, we don't know that. You know, you go in anybody, man, you know Tucson Overture? Tucson, man, the fuck is Tucson? That's a bad man. And not only him, it was, it was others as well, right? And that's why, you know, many of us argue, that's why Haiti is up under the circumstances of what it is, because, you know, white, white, white aggression didn't didn't like that. Doesn't tolerate that, that defeat. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Great. Um, All power to the people. Yeah. And yeah, that would be a, not a movie about slavery. No, no. <laughs> That's different. 